Good morning. Oh, thank you. Uh, welcome to Redeemer Eastside's worship service today. My name is Ian Costin, and I'm the Justice and Community Groups Manager here at Eastside, as well as on staff with our local college campus ministry, RUF, or Reformed University Fellowship. Whether you're here at Temple Israel or joining us online, we're so glad you're here today. Everything you need for, to follow along with the service will be on the screens, or you can download the digital worship guide linked in the description box of the YouTube video, and is also on the Redeemer app. For our call to worship today, we're going to look at Psalm 113, and here the psalmist says that the hope for the poor and the needy is only found in our Almighty Father. And this is especially apparent today, now that we're honoring as a country Independence Day. During the first Fourth of July, there were many who tasted real freedom from monarchical reign, but at the same time, there were millions of African Americans who were the epitome of the poor and the needy, and they were not free. For them, the promise of freedom was just that, a promise. And it took years for them to have their physical chains undone and even now still face the repercussions of that slavery today. So why do we still care about the unfulfilled promise of freedom that's observed today? Because we have a built-in hunger for freedom that is not satisfied in this world. And that is why today we come to the one who does satisfy to the one who provides us real freedom when we come to him in worship. So please stand and join me for today's call to worship from Psalm 119. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and on earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats with them with princes, with the princes of his people. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Please join me as I pray. Father, may you be praised. May your Son, Jesus Christ, be praised. May your Holy Spirit fill our hearts. O oh God, 
Darkness fears you. The whole earth praises you. The dividing walls of hostility found in racism, sexism, discrimination are no match for your love. We thank you that you are the one who grants us the freedom to fight against evil. For left to our own devices, O triune God, we are mired in oppression internally and externally. We thank you that because of your Holy Spirit, our eyes can be opened to see the ways you call us to be just, for you are just. We adore you for the fact that because you are our Father, we can sing the eternal song from all the ages on. May Jesus Christ be praised. And now, Father, we continue to praise you. Please hear our silent praises together. Father, we come to you and we praise you, and we do so now together to pray as your Son taught us, praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Confession is a time where we do the scary work of being specific about how we fall short in our pursuit to love others and love God. Now, we don't do it for some sadistic goal or to heap on guilt. We do it because we come to our God whose mercy is higher than the heavens and whose love is deeper than anything we could do to hurt God or others. We do it because healing is only found in Him. And we get to confess knowing our hearts is something that he hears, and he hears and takes on the ways that we falter. And so we confess our sins together, followed by a time of personal confession to the God who hears us. So we confess together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we thank you for your mercy is higher than the heavens, wider than our wanderings, deeper than all our sin. Forgive us our frivolous attitude toward life, our callousness toward suffering and injustice, our envy of those who have more than we have, our obsession with creating a life of constant pleasure, our indifference to the treasures of heaven, our neglect of your wise and gracious law. Help us to change our way of life so we may desire what is good 
Love what you love and do what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So please take the next few moments to offer your own personal private confessions to God, knowing that in his son Jesus we have forgiveness, healing, and hope. Let's do that now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our confessions to you. Amen. And for those who put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, hear these words of assurance of pardon from the book of Job. For then you would number my steps. You would not keep watch over my sin. My transgression would be sealed up in a bag, and you would cover over my iniquity. Amen. Please stand for our song of renewal. Amen. You may be seated. As we are renewed in our confession because of Christ, 
We continue to glorify God by honoring him and offering up the concerns and needs of our neighbors. We do this by entering into the time of the prayers of the people. We'll invite our brother James Song to the mic to lead us in a time of prayer for our brothers and sisters around the world. Please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to gather together in worship, both in person and online. We praise you for your goodness and faithfulness to your people. At this time, we want to lift up the needs of this world to you. As countries and world leaders, including our own, continue to work to address the health, safety, and economic impacts of COVID-19, we ask that you give them wisdom, courage, patience, and grace. We pray for everyone who's been affected by loss of family or loved ones, those who are fi uh, facing financial hardship. God, we are saddened to know that so many are suffering. And why, oh God, do you allow this? Why do you seem so distant at times? Please help bring comfort, peace, and address the needs of your beloved people. As we celebrate Independence Day this weekend, we pray for unity within this nation. We pray for government officials, local leaders, and fellow neighbors as we navigate these challenging times. We ask that you fill our hearts with empathy, mutual respect, and ongoing dialogue as we address to work to fix issues of pain, hurt, and isolation across different communities and socioeconomic groups. We lift up and pray for our beloved New York City. Help us to clearly see and be sensitive to the needs of the different neighborhoods. We ask that you help equip us with the resources and ability to love and care for those who are in need, to help cultivate a thriving and vibrant city that is known for building each other up. In addition, we want to lift up the needs of the church body. We pray for our church Redeemer East Side as we also navigate a time of transition. We pray for the church pastoral team, the staff, and the leaders. Fill them with hope and encouragement and peace. Strengthen them physically and lift them up when they feel they may falter. We also want to pray for the pastoral search committee members as they kick off the process to identify our new senior pastor for our congregation. We pray for a future building site in the adjacent communities. We pray that those who live, work, and pass through the area will be loved and will feel the positive impact of the presence of our church. Help us engage with, listen to, and love the people who will be present. Lastly, we pray for the churches around the globe. We pray for those who are doing ministry work with limited resources and those who face a real danger each day. Protect them, love them, lift them up, and we pray they are reminded of your constant faithfulness to them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, James. Please stand, and we will prepare to pass the peace of God to one another using God's word. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the good news. In Christ, we are healed, restored, forgiven. The peace of the Lord be always with you. For those of you at home, uh, please say hello via a text or maybe in the live chat. And for those of you here, learn someone's name, get a phone number, and move around and pass the peace of Christ to your fellow congregants.
All right, all right, all right, all right. Man, I'm so glad to hear all the chatter. It makes me happy. It almost feels like I'm talking with all of you. Uh, well, welcome, everyone, uh, again, to Redeemer Upper East Side. My name is Ian, and if you're especially new here, welcome to service. And in the sanctuary and in the YouTube chat, we have volunteers who'd love to answer any questions you might have um, so we can help you get plugged into our community. And I'm going to share a few announcements, so there are so many more that are listed in our digital worship guide. First, we are going to continue to celebrate the practices of peace with a wonderful picnic. That's right. Uh, as you can see, the weather is still very much out, pro outside. So as we continue to celebrate uh, how we can pause, eat, ask, commune, and examine with each other, we want to make sure we can continue to grow and recognize the season that we are just in as a church. I know for me, I personally love practicing ask more as I can see more of the beauty and joy in being curious about those around me. So next Sunday at the Central Park 76 and 5th, please check in on our website to make sure if there's, you know, weather delays or anything like that. Um, but we'd love to uh, see you there. Bring spike ball, bring a blanket, bring some donuts, uh, and we'll love to see you there. Our second announcement is about our virtual noonday prayer. And as we move into the summer and things in the city open up, we want to continue our regular practice of prayer, praying together as a church. So next week, our virtual noonday prayer services will be held weekly on Thursdays at noon on Zoom. So it's the same time and place on the link if you've been a regular attender at our other prayer services, and our hope is that this new rhythm will allow us to set aside a time in the middle of each week to practice examine scripture reading and prayer as a community. And it's really exciting to think about what God can do in response to His people, faithful and consistent prayer for healing and renewal. So please join us next Thursday for that. And finally, uh, there are two opportunities to pass this peace of God to our neighbors, especially those in marginalized communities. There are recurring engagements we have with our Upper East Side and East Harlem neighbors, through which we hope not only to meet urgent needs that are there, but also build genuine friendships and relationships over time. So please join us to pack and deliver food to our neighbors at the Wagner Houses on Fridays or at the Isaac Holmes Towers on Saturday. That's this week. And we'd especially use the help from uh, Spanish speakers in our congregation to help on our Friday outreach. So you can see the details right here on the screen, or you can see our website for more details and how to sign up. And that's it for me and announcements. Next, Emily Drennan will come to read the scripture for today, and then Pastor Hector will come to give us the teaching based off of that text. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Mesek, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. 
Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all of the youths who ate the king's food, that the steward took away the food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them none was found, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first king, first year of King Cyrus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. This summer uh, is a significant time of transition for us as a church. And it's not, not only our city is opening up and we're coming out of a, a global pandemic, but uh, we find ourselves in the midst of a leadership transition period. And add to these changes our own personal ones and the challenges that life sends our way, how do we deal with change and with challenges and adversities that inevitably come with life? Whether Christian or not, we all have to grapple with change and adversity sometimes. So how do we do it well? With this in mind, we're starting a new sermon series today on the book of Daniel that will take us through the summer and into the fall and we'll be going through chapter by chapter through this book that is on the one hand well known and on the other holds so much mystery. And yet as a whole, it's so timely for us today. And we're calling this sermon series With Daniel in Trials because as we journey with Daniel through the book, we will encounter the different challenges that Daniel had to deal with, that he faced. And we will learn how he thrived by holding on to the steady hand of his loving God, even as we look to do likewise ourselves in our time. And so we start this journey with this first chapter, and we'll look at our passage under these three headings, the exile, its pressures, and the needed resolve. The exile, its pressures, and the needed resolve. So the exile. It's hard to be an alien or a foreigner in a foreign land. It's scary. Different language, different customs, different ways of doing things. Um, it's frightening. I remember I came when I was eight, and I remember when they, they took me to my third grade class for the first time. And I remember being f absolutely terrified because nobody spoke Spanish. And all I knew was that my mom was on the other side of the door waving goodbye to me. It was scary. And it's scary even when you know the language. I mean, many of you have come to New York to work or for school, and, and it's scary. It's hard. How much more difficult would it be if it was against your will? How much more difficult would it have been if it was by force that, you're, that you were taken away from your family and from your home and brought to a place far away? That was Daniel's situation. That's what happened to him. It's the 6th century BC. Babylon is the rising power on the world stage. They had conquered peoples after peoples, like a sandstorm absorbing them into its empire. I'm sure Daniel, a teenager, commentators think that he was probably around 16 years of age, so probably a junior in high school. I'm sure he would have heard the reports of what, Dan uh, what Babylon was doing. But like any teenager, world events hardly seem relevant to your day-to-day -day existence, right? I mean, he probably had exams to study for. Or maybe he had, he, you know, he had practices to go for. Maybe he, he was in the soccer team. I don't know. According to verse 4, he was a straight-A student and physically fit. Maybe he participated in his neighborhood rock band. I don't know. 
But I'm sure, like any teenager, his mind was not preoccupied with geopolitics. And then, one day, the Babylonian sandstorm comes to his city, Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, it became very, very relevant. You see, when God had saved Israel out of Egypt in the Exodus, God had established them as a nation and had told them that as long as they were faithful to God, they would flourish and prosper in that land. But if they were unfaithful, God would remove his protection from over them, and they would be sent into exile. And God kept his promise. One time, a hundred years before our passage, a certain Assyrian general by the name of Sennacherib comes to the doorsteps of Jerusalem and besieges it. But the king of Israel at that time turns to God and he cries out to God and puts his trust in God and the Lord delivers Jerusalem. God came through. He kept his word. And he says this to Sennacherib in Isaiah 37. Zion despises you and mocks you as you flee. Who is it that you have ridiculed and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice? Against the Holy One of Israel. I will put my hook in your nose and I will make you return by the way that you, that you came. Let me translate that for you. In other words, who do you think you're talking to? Get out of my face. <laughs> and Sennacherib goes back to Assyria and as soon as he gets back to Assyria, he gets murdered by one of his sons. God does not play around. He kept this promise of protection. But the situation in our passage is different now. The kings of Israel, like Jehoiakim, time and again had, brought, had led the people into unfaithfulness, into idolatry, into putting their hopes in political alliances or military power, but not on God. And God sent prophet time it and again to warn them, to point them back to the grace of God, but they refused. And so God took away his protection from them, and they, and they went into exile. Verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar. That's another name for Babylon. It is hard to describe the level of catastrophe that this represented. The Babylonians were brutal. Read Psalm 137 when you have a chance, and you'll see the things that they did once they came into Jerusalem, especially to children. It is hard to imagine a deeper level of cruelty than that which these people practiced. And in three waves, they came to sack Jerusalem. In the first wave, they took all of the nobility. In the second wave, they took all the white-collar professionals. And finally, in the third wave, they demolished the city and the temple, and they took almost all of the rest of the people to Babylon. Daniel was taken in the first wave. Verse 3, then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people to Israel, from Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility. Verse 6, among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Just imagine. One day he's in, your, he's in his house, studying for his finals, and a knock on the door. Men dressed in the uniforms that he didn't recognize, screaming things that he couldn't understand, dragging him away. No chance to say goodbye to his mom or his dad. No, ch no chance for final words or to pack up his things. Just screams of terror. And off he went on a 600-mile march to Babylon. He would never see home again. What was that like? Thankfully, the Babylonians didn't treat them like they treated the people at Jerusalem. They had different plans for these boys. As they entered the great city of Babylon with its hanging gardens and high-rises, they were not directed to the dungeon for prisoners of war but to an elite boarding school and treated like royalty? They had been selected to go to the Harvard of Babylon with full scholarship paid for by the king himself. 
And once finished, they would have a career waiting for them in the top echelons of civil service in the most powerful government of the day. What is going on? This doesn't make sense. Why are these prisoners being treated this way? Daniel recognized what was going on. He recognized that it's not a, it wasn't out of the goodness of their Babylonian heart that they were doing this. But they were doing this because, you see, there are two ways to conform something into a mold. By force or by melting. Pharaoh in Egypt had used the method of force on the people of Israel. And all that did was it increased their number and their strength. Nebuchadnezzar, however, knew that you can conquer by force, but you cannot effectively assimilate by force. In order to erase their cultural and religious identity, you have to treat them well and melt them with pressure. Just put pressure, and little by little, over a short period of time, they will melt into Babylon's arms and forget about their land and their God. You see, the roots of this story go all the way back to the beginning of creation and reach us here today. God had made mankind to be in paradise with him forever, to delight in the joys of his presence, of his love for us, and all the deepest joys in life, all of them, the joy of friendship, the joy of welcoming a child into this world, the joy of intimacy, the joy of beauty, all of the joys in life are merely signposts pointing us to the joy that we were created for with God in his presence, in paradise, in his kingdom. In the Garden of Eden, God places man and woman, and he tells them that they could enjoy everything that was there, all of it, except one tree, just one. And God does this because he doesn't want robots. He desires our willing love giving back to him. And that could only happen if it was a choice, if there was a choice involved. And that is what the tree represented, the possibility of choice. And Adam and Eve chose not to love God. He chose not to trust in his goodness. And they ate the fruit and experimented with evil. And for that, they were sent into exile outside of the garden, outside of the kingdom of God. And that's what the exile represents, the place outside of God's presence, the place of frustration, of separation, of death. And that is the story of humanity. We chose not to trust in God's goodness and to turn to other things instead, and we find ourselves frustrated, dead inside. And as a human race, we are in exile, living away from God and his kingdom. But the story of the Bible is the story of how God in his love is seeking us out, of how he is working to deliver us from evil in this world and the, de and the evil inside of us, and how he is restoring us to paradise, to himself, to his kingdom. And the good news of the Bible is that Jesus, the Son of God, the King of heaven, because of his love for us, became a man and came in search of us and brought his kingdom with him. Heaven invaded earth. And that's why he would preach, the kingdom of God is at hand, or the kingdom of God is among you. And by his death and resurrection, he makes a way for the kingdom of God to invade this world. And so the kingdom of God is invading and advancing this in this world. And that's why Jesus sent his disciples to go into all the world and tell the good news, the Great Commission. And when Jesus returns, as he promised, the kingdom of God will finally be put, be fully here, and mankind will finally be restored to paradise fully. In the meantime, though, the people of God are called to live as an embassy of the kingdom of God in a foreign land calling all peoples everywhere, come one, come all, come and become citizens of God's amazing ki kingdom by faith in his king, Jesus. 
And the New Testament in 2 Peter tells Christians to consider themselves foreigners in this world. That this world with its frustrations and sadness and darkness is not our ultimate home. Because our citizenship is in heaven, in the kingdom of God, where love and joy and truth and peace reign. And so while we await the return of our king, we are to live like Daniel. Citizens of Jerusalem living in Babylon. But Babylon in the Bible not only is a city in the ancient world, but it also represents the system of this world that is in opposition to the rule of God and his kingdom. And so we're in this strange place where we live in the world that was made by God and for God, but it is currently in rebellion against him. And we are called to display, as an embassy of the kingdom, we're called to display in beautiful, winsome ways by the way that we love and live what the kingdom of God is like to all those around us so that all would see the beauty and the grace of Jesus our King and come to him. The problem is that Babylon is not neutral. It is actively seeking the allegiance and affections of our hearts. In Revelation, actually, um, the Bible calls, um, likens Babylon to a prostitute trying to lure her client into her bedroom. It is actively applying pressure to make us hers. Point number two, the pressures. So she applies pressures to make us hers, to melt us into her arms. In our passage, we see the pressure of freedom, the pressure of new learning, the pressure of new names, and the pressure of her table, the pressure of freedom. So Daniel finds himself in this big metropolis, no longer under the watchful eye of his parents or his neighbors or his rabbi. He is free, in a sense, right? Free from the cultural and familial expectations of how he is to behave and what is he to believe. He is free. And it is in such an environment that we really find out who we are. Did he really believe in God or was it just a cultural thing for him? Did he really believe in God or was it just a pleasing his parents kind of thing for him? And isn't this the case for many of us here in New York? We come here for school or work and we are now free. Free from the watchful eye of our family or free from the Christian subculture from which we came from maybe. Finally, nobody to nag us to come to church. <laughs> and in this freedom, we will experience Babylon's pressure to walk like we don't belong to the kingdom of God. The pressure of new learning. Verse 3, Then the king commanded Ashpenaz to bring some of the youths to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So no longer Hebrew or biblical studies were on his schedule now Daniel was going to be exposed to new learning, most of which was going to cause him to question his faith in God. The new subjects, Sorcery 101, followed by the Black Magic intro. <laughs> and after lunch break, theological studies on Babylonian deities. Oh, and let's not forget, Akkadian language lab practiced by immersion. <laughs> Three years of this new education program, and of course there was going to be pressure. Pressure to see Yahweh, the God of Israel, as just one more God among many. Pressure to lose his language and to lose touch with his roots in the kingdom of God. Pressure to adopt the wisdom of Babylon instead of living by the wisdom of the kingdom of God. Three years of constant pressure. How is Babylon doing that to us? In New York City, maybe it's not the pressure of the dark arts of magic, <laughs> but with materialism, driving individualism deeper into us, or maybe it's teaching us its language, the language of status or image consciousness. How is Babylon doing this to us? The pressure of a new name. Verse 7. 
And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Daniel and his friends were given new Babylonian names. Instead of Daniel, God is my judge. That's what it means. Belteshazzar, the keeper of the hidden secrets of Bel. <laughs> Instead of Hananiah, which means God has been gracious to me, Shadrach, the command of Aku, the moon god. Instead of Michel, who is like God? Meshach, who is like Aku? Instead of Azariah, God has helped me. Abednego, I am the servant of Nebo. Babylon is out to erase all trace of God's sovereignty, of his grace, and of his help. Sinclair Ferguson, a Bible teacher, comments, anything that reminded them of their origin and destiny was removed. As they heard their names called day after day, it was an added temptation for them to yield to the pressure to think of themselves as citizens of Babylon rather than of Jerusalem, the kingdom of God. How is Babylon changing our name? How is New York changing our name? It's probably not a religious name for us here in the West, isn't it? But maybe it's one that distorts our view of reality, like the name, you are the center of the universe, when we're really not. Or maybe it's one of those names that echo deep in our hearts, like the name, inadequate, or not good enough. Or perhaps it's the names that you were called when you were little that still reverberate even till now. Useless. Ugly. What is Babylon calling you? The gospel reminds you that in Jesus you do have a name. And that name is Beloved. The pressure of Babylon's table. Verse 5. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. In other words, give them a taste of success, a taste of the fine life. And day after day, Daniel and his friends were to be lured, seduced by the taste of Babylon. Colin Smith, a pastor, comments every mealtime was a message taste the fruit of what success can offer you. Get used to it. Enjoy it. Taste it. Babylon is not neutral. It was seeking Daniel's allegiance and affections, seeking to erase any sign of his citizenship in the kingdom of God, trying to melt him into the mold, into Babylon's arms. And it is trying to do it to us too. Do you feel the pressure? Point three, the needed resolve. Verse eight. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. You know, in the, in the face of all these pressures, it's tempting to do a couple of things. One, give in, assimilate. Two, get into a bubble. Or three, become militant. And we see Christians do this, some assimilate and have no, no, nothing distinct about them. They've adopted Babylon's values. Other pockets retreat into Christian bubbles and, you know, f with fearful attitudes about the culture. Others become militant and seek the reins of power. And boy, have we seen ugly versions of this recently. But Daniel doesn't take any of these roads. He understood that his posture needed to be different. He read what God had said through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29. This is what the God of Israel says to all those I have carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Daniel understood that God was sovereign in all of these things that were happening. It had been God who had given Jehoiakim to Nebuchadnezzar, over to Nebuchadnezzar. It had been God who had brought them into Babylon in exile. 
So getting into a bubble or becoming militant or assimilating were not options for him. Yet God was telling him that he had to engage in the city and in the culture and to seek its shalom, its peace and prosperity. And that is why Daniel is willing to answer by his new name and willing to be educated and accept that scholarship and become fully familiar with Babylonian culture. And that's why Daniel never returns to Israel. He stays and commits to Babylon. And that is the same attitude that God wants us to have, to seek the shalom, the peace and prosperity of the place where God has planted us while remaining faithful to him. But Daniel knew himself. He knew that he had to draw the line somewhere in order not to give in, in order not to assimilate, in order to keep himself faithful to God. That's why he uses the word defile, which is a religious word. So where does he draw the line? He draws the line on the table. He decides not to eat from the Babylonian table. Why? Why doesn't he want the food? Commentators are divided here. Some say that Daniel did not want the food because it wasn't kosher. And some others say that Daniel didn't want the food because it had been dedicated to idols. But wine was kosher, and yet Daniel decides not to drink wine. And if the reason was that food was dedicated to idols, wouldn't the vegetables that he was going to eat be dedicated to idols as well? So that doesn't work. So why the table? Why the food? <laughs> the answer is a bit surprising. The answer is, we really don't know. <laughs> there was nothing intrinsically unlawful or sinful about this food. Daniel did not reject the food simply because it broke a rule, but maybe because he knew himself and his weaknesses. The king's food would be a temptation too strong and would move him beyond just learning about the values of Babylon into accepting them and adopting them for himself. A commentator says he knew there was nothing intrinsically sinful about tasting the king's food, but he realized that it would tempt him to get sucked into the idolatrous love of money and status and beauty and material luxury and power. Daniel knew himself. But he wanted to keep his heart for God. And he did this by drawing a line on the table. And as a consequence of this, it made him an effective witness to those around him. Look, and to those around him and his culture. First, this decision encourages his friends in their own commitment to God. You see this, right? They join him. Second, the Babylonians start noticing. The steward notices, Ashpenaz notices, Nebuchadnezzar notices, and eventually the entire city notices that these people are different. And the culture notices. This resolve empowered them to become masters of Babylonian culture and learning instead of being mastered by it. Verse 17 to 20 says, As a result, God gave them learning and skill in all of literature and wisdom. And at the end, the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in the kingdom. Effective witnesses of the kingdom of God. Salt and light. Daniel did not reject the food simply because it broke a rule, but because it would have been a temptation to give in to Babylon. And we all have the same dangers. We have to know our own hearts and the idols of our culture and which ones our hearts are weak against. And then start drawing some lines. Where do we need to draw a line? We need to have resolve to draw lines. So where do we get resolve? How do we get that resolve when Babylon is so attractive? Daniel had the resolve to reject Nebuchadnezzar's table, the table of Babylon, because he was eating at another table set by another king, the table of the Lord. Let me explain. 
Daniel knew that unlike Jehoiakim, who was an unfaithful king, the scriptures promised that one day there would be another king of Judah that would come, the true king of the, king of, of the kingdom of God. And that one day all the people of God would eat and feast with him in the kingdom of God. For example, Daniel would have read Isaiah 25 that speaks about this king. And this is what it says. He will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow. And he will swallow up death forever and will wipe away the tears from all the faces. Daniel knew this promise and many more like these. And eating something simple instead of the luxurious meal of Nebuchadnezzar would remind Daniel daily that Babylon is not his ultimate home. That there was a feast awaiting him with the real king of Judah. And so he asked Aspenash, can you please give me some vegetables to eat and some water to drink instead? A simple meal that would be a reminder of his citizenship in heaven, in the kingdom of God. And you know that Christians do this too. When we come to the Lord's Supper, also called the Eucharist or Communion, that is exactly what we do. That's exactly what Christians do. When we come to the Lord's table, which, by the way, we're celebrating next week, so please make sure to come, we remember that this world is not our ultimate home, that our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And every time we come to the Lord's table, we eat a little piece of bread and drink a little bit of wine. And what they, these elements point us to that is where we get the power to have the resolve to face Babylon and to resist her pressures and to keep ourselves for God, even as we engage winsomely in our city and our culture. Listen to Matthew 26. Now Jesus took the bread and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. And he took the cup and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The bread represents the body of Jesus, the true king of Judah, given to us by God, broken for us. Jesus' body was broken on the cross for us. And the wine represents his blood shed for us. Jesus had the resolve to be faithful to God even when it meant his death. And he had the resolve to go to the cross and stay on the cross for you and for me, for the forgiveness of our sins and idolatries and selfishness and darkness and unfaithfulness. And it is only when we sit at this table and realize how committed he is to us and as we get a glimpse of how, we, how loved we are by him, that we can have the power to draw the line or lines <laughs> and be as resolute as Daniel was. But Jesus continues and says this, I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new, when I drink it, drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Friends, brothers and sisters, one day we will drink and eat in a great feast with our king when he establishes his kingdom fully here on earth. What a day that will be. But until then, we eat a simple meal, like Daniel, the meal of the cross, remembering where our citizenship is even as we live in Babylon. Please pray with me. Father... We want to thank you for making us, bringing us into your kingdom. Thank you for sending the true king of Judah, Jesus, in search for us, Lord. Please give us the power, Lord, to live faithfully for you, even as we live in Babylon like Daniel. For the glory of your name, we thank you. Amen. Now, after having received the word of God for us, we come to the time of our offering. Now, our offering is not a time for us to just give money because of Babylonian pressures or standards, but out of trust and faithfulness and resolve as citizens to the true king. 
So you'll find giving information on the screen and on your bulletin of how to give. So now let's come to him offering our hearts as well as our gifts.
A few reminders before the, we conclude with the benediction. If there's anything that you like to pray with, with someone or, or you just want to talk with somebody, we have trained officers of the church that will be up in the front of the sanctuary after the benediction. So please come up. We'd love to pray or talk with you. Also, uh, you can call in the number if you're watching from home, the number that will appear on the screen to get also some help. And now please lift up your heads for today's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the true King of Judah, and the love of God the Father who gave him for us, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, give you the resolve that we need, and bless you this week, today, and always. Amen. Let us go forth to serve the, Lord, the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank you for coming. See you next week. Thank you.